So uh, today we're delighted to have Professor Aparecida Vilasa with us to give the inaugural peak uh, memorial lecture. Um, we're particularly fortunate that she's braved these horrible uh, Scottish skies and, uh, and weather, and because she is a close friend and colleague of Pete's, of course. Uh, Aparecida is Professor of Anthropology at the Museo Nacional, the Universidad Federal de Rio de Janeiro, and currently visiting Simon Bolivar Professor at the Centre for Latin American Studies at the University of Cambridge. She is the author, amongst other books, of Strange Enemies, Indigenous Agency and Scenes of Encounters in Amazonia, Praying and Praying, Christianity and Indigenous Amazonia, of Jaguars and Butterflies, Metalogues on Issues in Anthropology and Philosophy, and Paletoa, Paletoa and Me, Memories of My Indigenous Father, which recently won the prestigious Casa de las Americas Prize for Nonfiction. So today she'll be given a talk entitled Do Myths Ever Die? Sociocultural Changes and Mythical Transformations in Indigenous Amazonia, a dialogue with Peter Cow. So I'll just uh, ask you all to give Aparecida a warm welcome. So is it better with uh, this microphone, this small one? So I'll have to carry it the whole time. Uh, it's in the power mic, so we should be able oh. to just put it and try and fix it on. Okay. Is that okay? And uh, turn the light on? I think so, yeah. Okay, let's try that. Oh. <laughs> no, it doesn't work. Uh, it's better without the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> it might be impossible with it. <laughs> And the other one is better if you stand away from this microphone in front of you. So, I think we'll take this one off yeah, and just not stand too close to there. But now that it's being recorded, we can use captions if they're really struggling. Do you need the light to read the first or is it okay to? I think the, the light is enough for me. I don't think that's what the light is. That, okay. that light is, yeah, and we can, they can read the... Okay, over so, to you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm going to read. I'm, I'm very emotional, but I'll do my best reading it. Okay. It's a great honor for me to be invited to give this lecture. As you probably know, Peter was just not just a colleague whose work I admire very much, but a dear and close friend. As much as I feel proud to be here praising his work, I also feel sad to know he's not here to listen. He passed away far too early. Anyway, this invitation gave me the opportunity to go back to his work, and I was positively surprised to discover that those readings allowed me to feel him close again, as if he was talking privately with me. He was certainly one of the most original and sensitive anthropologists of my generation. We were born the same year. Americanists all recognize that his two monographic books, Of Mixed Blood and An Amazonian Myth and Its History, made a revolution in the studies of social and cultural change, as much as in kinship and historical studies. In this lecture, following Pete's lead, I want to do an exercise in what some may call old-fashioned anthropology, leaving aside some trendy subjects and diving into the structural analysis of mythology. My aim is to enter into dialogue with Peter's last book, An Amazonian Myth and Its History. Peter adapted levi structural analysis of mythic transformation across different societies to analyze how the myth he called a man who was tired of living changed over time. He combined this with Malinovskian fieldwork to show how different versions of the myth produced over four decades gave us understanding of important historical change, experience by the people, Piro people from Peruvian Amazonia, at the same time illustrating Levistro's statement about myth being a tool to erase history, to make it invisible, 
creating the illusion that the world has always been the same. I want to apply Peter's analysis to two myths from the Wadi people from Southwest Amazonia, with whom I've been working for almost four decades. One myth named the Great Flood, and the other named Orupshi. Considering that the Wadi experience since the first contacts with the whites, the way they call us, Brancos, between 1956 and 1961, some of the same historical events that Peru people did, uh, missionization and schooling, I want to examine how these events inflected the content of the myths. From versions collected over 40 years, by coincidence, the same time span as Pete, I will focus the analysis on versions reproduced in the master thesis of a 47-year-old Wadi man, Francisco Oruwaram, who went through all the school system uh, from the missionaries' teachings at the village and the so-called intercultural education to the regular public university, where he got a master degree in geography in 2019. I will compare this is Francisco in the middle. I will compare Francisco's own versions with the narratives of the same two myths chronologically organized. First, short versions collected in 1977 <clears throat> and 79 in Portuguese by a non-indigenous university student who was a former government employee with the indigenous service department, the SPI. And second, versions I've recorded in the 1980s and early 90s by Wadi elders, mainly men, who were monolingual in Wadi language. Regarding, as we will see, the way the myths were appropriated by Francisco as if they were narratives about the historical past of the Wadi people to explain their origin and their social organization, I want to explore also a particular point made by Levi Strauss in an article named How Myth Die, originally published in uh, 1971, which appeared afterwards in Structural Anthropology, Volume 2. In it, he recognizes that the transformation of myths from one society to another is not an unlimited procedure because in the process, myths can die, meaning that they can become something else taking the form of romantic tale or legendary tradition. In his words, and I quote Levi Strauss, thus a myth which is transformed, passing from tribe to tribe, finally exhausts itself without disappearing for all of that. Two paths still remain open, that of fictional elaboration and that of reactivation with a view to legitimizing history, unquote. Although Levi Strauss is a bit ambiguous when affirming that the myth dies but does not disappear, I understand, especially through his chapter on the structure of myths, that radical transformations mean conscious transformations and not the collective and unconscious structural ones that happen when myths pass from one society to another. In that way, a myth becomes a legend when some specific agent or a collective transform the narrative into a historical tale with some specific purpose. It comes to us to try to understand what remains from the myth that makes it, it still recognizable by an indigenous listener as the same myth, which suggests that what looks like a rupture in the logic of the myth is not exactly so, and that what Levi Strauss calls a legend keeps important continuities with previous versions of the myth, which may be exactly what the author means by the myth not disappearing. Considering this and passing from one geographical displacement, from geographical displacements between societies, as Levi Strauss did, to changes through time within one single society, as Pete did, 
My aim is to understand what the different versions tell us about the historical change experienced by the Wadi. The Wadi are a group of around 4,000 people, speakers of a Chapakuran uh, lingua, a language of the Chapakura linguistic family, inhabiting around 30 villages at the west of the Brazilian state of Rondonia. According to their memory, according to their memory, until 1956, they had no peaceful contact either with other indigenous people or with the whites who inhabited the large rivers. Their villages were located close to small streams. At the moment, they were constituted by eight territorially related subgroups who call each other Tatrim, which I translated by foreigner, spoke slightly different dialects of the same language, have slightly different versions of their common myth, and marry among themselves. Apart from the informal visits to other territories to meet relatives related to mixed marriages, the main setting for the encounters between people from different subgroups were rituals in which they act in open hostility, metaphorically killing foreigners with an excess of fermented maize beer. There were no internal wars, and the enemy was either neighboring indigenous people or when those disappeared, chased by the whites, the whites themselves. Wait. At the time of the first contacts, territorial divisions were a little blurred as they were fleeing from the whites coming from the large rivers, as the Madeira and Mamore rivers in Amazonia. But they still presented themselves as, and this is the name of the subgroups, Orundau, Oroel, Eruat, and Oruaram, which is the subgroup of Francisco, our main um, person here. The arrival uh, of the contact expeditions organized by the Brazilian government and the new tribe's evangelical missionaries and the Catholic priests brought severe epidemics, which on top of the early urban massacres caused the mortality of around two thirds of the very population. The survivors grouped themselves around the so-called posts where they were given medicine and food and received the first Christian teachings. Even though each one of the posts was situated roughly in one of the traditional territories, neighboring subgroups began to live together. Two other reasons contributed to the effacement of subgroup distinctiveness. The rituals, the main setting for intergroup encounters, were suspended due to grief, and the whites, who became the other by excellence, treated them as a unity under the name of Pacas Novos, referring to the river where they were first seen. A few years later, due to missionaries' work, they declared themselves Christians and no longer engaged in hostility rituals. They also took Genesis as their creation myth, and animals traditionally considered human were objectified, becoming mere prey. Until that time, literacy courses were given first by the missionaries to a few adults to make them into interprets in their translating work. And afterwards, when village schools were created exclusively to children. In 1991, due to an education reform in Brazil linked to the new rights given to the indigenous population by the new Brazilian constitution, a new approach to indigenous education was inaugurated with an emphasis on their cultural specificities. So let's go to the myths now. I prepared some slides with um, pieces of the myths. I'm going to read it just for you to, to fix them. Uh, and the, the parts that are in red are the parts that I just um, underline for you to, because those are the, the main uh, features that I want to, to um, to, to make emphasis on. So, but if you just want to listen to stories, to nice stories, don't look at the slides. I will just tell them here, okay? <laughs> so the, the, the slides are just to add the memory. So, let's begin by, uh, this is version one. Let's begin by a very brief version 
uh, from 1977-79 collected in Portuguese by a former government employee at the Ribeirão Post from a wedding man. By the text, it's evident that the narrator has no control of the Portuguese language, and I'll try to make the translation faithful to it. So I quote, lots of rain, lots of rain, rain, rain. Then the old man warms his hands in the fire. Rain, rain, rain. The fish appeared in the hole in the house. Fish fell out. The old man kills the fish and eats it in the malocca. Rain, rain. It floods everything at night. It floods house, it kills people, it kills everything. An Indian ran off into the bush with his wife and two children, two girls. Then he went to live in the rocks. Then he looked for people, found monkeys sucking, sucking papaya, monkey people. And he went after them. In the house, in the rocks, he looks for a chief and marries the daughter of an Indian who has fled into the bush. The monkey married the girl. The son was born with a tail and put in a pot and the tail was cut off. Then we were born without a tail. We, and so end of quote. We pass now to a more complete version narrated to me by an elder in December 1993. He named the myth after his main character, a man nicknamed na 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 because of linguistic peculiarity, a kind of stutter. He, finished, he, he finishes his phrases repeating the sound na. So na 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 or the great flood, it's the same myth. So I quote, this is what the ancient ones told about the spirit of the rain. A very long time ago, it rained heavily for days on end. Eventually, the spirit of the rain arrived. It appeared like an old woman, their maternal grandmother. She brought a very old basket. The woman said, the women, our mother arrived. She was just like the mother of the women. The rain had transformed. You Green mother, yes, the fire of your older brothers went out. They have nothing to eat, said the woman faintly. Really, replied the daughter, steering Shicha over the fire. The old woman sat down next to the fire and warmed her hands. She warmed them a long time and said, I'm going. Give me fire to take to your older brothers and mothers. They are dying there. She said they wanted to fire the fire to roast their food and eat. A lie. She probably had fire. The rain had transformed into a person. We'll go with you, maternal grandmother. We feel sorry for you in this rain. Stay, stay, I'll go along. She said this because the spirit of the rain was not human. She took the fire. As she left, the rain started to fall heavily. The water began to seep into the houses. The fish swam into the house and people began to kill them. Na 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 was wiser. Let's flee. Let's, uh, there is a chance we all drown here, children. Let's go to the house next to our May Sweden. The water will kill us, he said to his daughters. He and his daughters went, but their husband stayed. Go with your father. We will stay here to kill fish so you can roast them for us, they said to their wives. At night, they roasted fish and ate. They were sleeping when the ancestors drowned. The next day, so you see that it's a summary in the slide. The next day, the father, na 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 na, said, let's go to, the, to see the village. The water has flooded the Swedens. Only the house posts were visible. Our grandchildren's fathers drowned at Nana Nana -na, na They could hear the sound of women grinding maize on stone coming from under the water, as though people were still alive in the village. I feel so, let's get them, Nana Nana -na -na, cut down some sticks, bound them together and went to the village. I feel sorry for my daughters, Nana Nana -na -na -na. The single girls, 
those who were underwater, said, okay, let's go with our older brother. They climbed the ladder, climbed, climbed. Their hands emerged. When the heads broke the surface, they slipped and turned into river dolphins. Na 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 said to the boys, boys, have pity for us. We are left all alone. So the boys under the water uh, answered, okay, let's meet our older brother. So those who had been asleep in the men's house began to climb the sticks. When the arms broke the surface, the water surface, they slipped and became otters. And an old woman turned into a caiman. A war club fell in the water and turned into electric fish. And a bit of, of pen fell in the water too and became stingray. They returned to their new village. After a time, he said, na 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 said, let's look for people, na 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 na. He went into the forest with his daughters and found a Sweden made by another people. He, he called them chikunwari, another people, another human beings. He saw fruits, papayas. He told his daughters, I found people, wari. Let's get them so we can eat fruit too. Okay, said the women. Don't be afraid of them, he said. Okay, the women replied. The father sat down near the fruits. He waited until the women of the other people appeared. They came to eat fruit. He grabbed one woman's arm. We won't kill you. Our grandchildren's father, fathers drowned. Na, 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 na. Really? He told them everything and asked it. Do you have older brothers? Yes, we do. Our older brothers live over there. Run and tell them. Okay, the women replied. They left. Later, their younger and older brothers arrived. Marry my daughters, he said. So the rock people became married men. The father of these men who lived inside the rocks wanted to leave. His sons had already left. He said, I want to see your wives, my sons. He rubbed his body with a leaf to become slippery, but he couldn't squeeze through the hole in the rocks. He was very corpulent. The mother too. The newly married young men had children. When the latter were older, they took them to see their grandparents. They made many Swedens, first close to their parents' house, but as they procreated and became many, they had to clear Swedens even farther away. Perhaps their father had died. They spread further and further, and their children cleared new Swedens. End of quote. Some other versions uh, I've collected, I've, I've heard, uh, were closer to the one from the 70s regarding the nature of the inhabitants of the rocks. Although instead of saying directly that they were monkeys, these versions mention that they had tails, a weakening of the myth in levi terms that might be related to a previous period of conversion to Christianity and missionaries' teachings about the non-humanity of animals. The versions end like that. Na 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 met the people in the rocks who, despite their human appearance, had tails. Na 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 offered his daughters in marriage. The children were born tailless, or the tails were cut soon after birth. The father and mother of the rock inhabitants were unable to leave, remaining stuck inside. They cursed those outside, saying that nobody would grow anymore and parents would stay the same hate as their children. Of the 30 versions I've recorded of the myth, only three of them constitute an origin myth of the Wari subgroups. They begin as the other versions and include the episode of transformations. After the couples leave the rocks and disperse, ancestors of each subgroup left carrying in the mouth one object that will further on characterize their teeth. Each subgroup was named by another one due to some specific behavior. So now let's go to 
school and Francisco's own versions. So the thesis, the master thesis in geography from 2019 and the myths. Francisco's master thesis entitled Memories and Knowledge of the Oroaran People begins by presenting in his own words the origin of the Wari and ends with a compilation of myths according to elders' narratives, some of them extracted from a school book from 2015 written by Wadi students and organized by non-indigenous teachers. I will summarize here one of the version he cites in the last part of the thesis. This is our version three. After the old woman left, fish began to rise and the Wadi hooked them. The rain continued to fall to the point that, and then I quote his words, there was no forest or land. There was only one thing, water. Water everywhere. A man left the village with his wife and daughters, climbed at the roof of the corn shelter and survived. All the whole houses and people at the village disappeared. Three years after he went out to search for, for people and found traces without knowing if they were Wari or enemies. He saw a woman, grabbed her arm and explained his family situation, asking her if she got brothers to marry his daughters. Introduced to them, he noticed that the men had tails, but they accepted to marry with the women. The parents were very fat and could not get out from the cave, which has a narrow entrance. You note that he uses cave instead of rock. Enraged, they cursed the new couples saying, your wives will get small and won't get bigger than your waist. The daughters got children and grandchildren and eventually the tails disappeared. End of his uh, version, one of his versions. We note um, uh, that in this version, uh, it's similar with the one I've uh, heard, mentioning the mixture of land and water, the tails and the curse at the end. So now let's go to what I call his legendary version following levi strauss about the uh, death of myths. This is our version four. In the introduction to chapter one of his master thesis, Francisco states, the ancestors believed that they were the real people, the first people of humanity, and the only one to have appeared on planet Earth. He uses Makan, Makan, which is the name of the Wadi used for Earth, Earth, the substance. Then in chapter one itself, in the first item, name it the origin of the Wadi. He gives his full version, which looks very different from the one just mentioned, which he presented in the third part of the thesis, although he considers them as the same myth. So let's go. This is, I'm quoting literally, uh, except that it was written in Portuguese, okay? For many years, the Wadi lived in a cave collectively and were the only people on this planet multiplying more and more. As such, the cave represented the life of the Wadi, the heritage of their identity. The Wadi lived from their relationship with nature and always treated it with the utmost respect, especially the animals. Even when searching for food for their survival, they rarely left their cave dwellings. There, they were controlled by themselves, thus forming a culture in which there were limits to how people could go out and how many people could go out in search of food. For many years, they were suffered from this nutrition problem. As the number of families increased demographically in the space of the cave, they become unable to continue living there. One day, some groups of Wadi families who had survived the great flood came and told us 
what had happened to their relatives who had died in the catastrophe. Shortly afterwards, they decided to offer their daughters to a married man. They kept marrying them and at the same time encouraged their relatives to leave the cave as a form of cultural above, and above all human preservation, identifying themselves as Wari, not specifying the surnames of the subgroups. Each couple who left the cave carried a piece of some object in their mouths, such as a tabaka, tracom, and an ear of corn. These objects had significance for the people who came out, and they put them in their mouths. The wadi usually came out of the cave in the early morning, at around 6 o'clock. As there were many wadi in the cave, it took a long time to finalize the exit. Those who came out had a normal body, but as time went by, the people began to put on weight as a result of their tribal routines. Consequently, the parents couldn't get out of the cave because their bodies were so big, like monsters. The parents became very desperate and called for help. They shouted, cried, and said to the crowd in general, you should know that your hate as men and women is normal for the time being, but over thousands of years, the sizes will decrease until your children's size. That's why the, child, the, the size of the wadi today is not the same as before. We immediately, so end of the myth. Uh, we immediately notice that there is a weaken, weakening of the rain episode, which appears just as a mention to the great flood in his version. More noticeable, though, is the identification of the narrator with the cave people who were taken as the Wari ancestors, not as possible enemies or monkeys, as in the previous versions. Consequently, instead of having tails, the parents were like monsters, People who survived the flood, although also named Wari by, by himself, were not the main agents anymore, but secondary characters. The curse at the end is preserved, so you're not uh, going to grow up anymore. So I, I'm, I'm just now trying to show some important changes. Okay, so I'm gonna read from here. So some of the radical cha changes made uh, by, by Francisco. Yeah. So, in search of the notion of belief, he says, the ancestors believed. The concept of totality and of the earth, translated by the Wadi name of earth, Makam, they were the real people, the first people of humanity, and the only one to have appeared on planet earth. They were the only people in this planet. Three, he locates the Wadi ancestors, not in the submersed village, but in cave, as the monkey people or enemies encountered at the end of all other versions. He uses the name cave instead of rocks. He introduces terms as identity, heritage, traditional knowledge, ritual, beliefs, clock time, when, they, when he says they left the cave at around six o'clock, and the idea uh, of respect for nature and the, the animals. A relation between... Um, population growth and nutritional now problems. The survivors from the flood are named Wari, although not ancestors, and they came to meet the people at the cave who were said to be the only humans on earth and also called Wari people. No mention to tails or to monkey people. Eight, after the marriage, they left the cave but still identified themselves as Wari, not yet divided in subgroups although they left the cave carrying an object in their mouths, the same that identified the different subgroups in the versions I've heard. Nine, the parents could not leave the cave for being very big, like monsters, and cursed their children. You should know that your hate as man and woman is normal for the time being, but over thousands of years, the size will decrease until your children's size, which also appeared in some of my versions. The influence of schooling 
and its obsession with origins, global issues, and uh, nature is evident in his version. And probably Plato's cave story, which they were taught as a philosophy subject, also served as inspiration. Reading textbooks, reading myself textbooks on history and geography, prepared by non-indigenous teachers, we usually see questions uh, asking for the origin of the student's people or of some component of their environment as water. More than that, myths are taking as past history, a way to understand present times. This is in the textbooks. Being adapted to school concerns, the myth seems to become something else, a legend in levi terms. However, a closer examination, especially when we consider the second myth explored in the thesis and the way it's related to the first one, we will see that this version, his version, despite of the radical changes, could be considered a structural transformation of the earlier ones, as if the myth has captured the changes into its own structure. Let's begin by presenting the second myth. The second myth to be analyzed is named Orupshi, and it's where Francisco locates the origin of the subgroups. According to the versions I've recorded in the 90s and 80s, it tells of a newborn baby who cried desperately and no one could calm him down except for his elder brother's wife. While he was, she was cuddling him at the back of the house, he became a man and made sex with her. It happened every day until a parrot saw them and spoke out the news. The elder brother got mad and burned the babe's belonging. Enraged, Oropshi went away, causing a heavy rain, which took away all the water not before leaving some water with his parents, who were advised not to give it to anyone. People suffered with thirst and menstruating women could not bathe. Brazilian nut trees were sprouting in the riverbed. The elder brother decided to look for a rupchi and found him living by a large river, the place where the whites came from far away from Wali villages, where, which uh, were located next to small streams. Some versions say that there were many houses in large Sweden. The elder brother offered Orobshi his wife. In most versions, he agrees and come back home, taking the water back with him. Narrators use it to say that Orobshi is the owner of the water. Some extended versions say that after some time, Orobshi went back to the large river, taking his family with him, with him. For a while, they visited each other and exchanged rituals as do people from different subgroups. After some time, when visiting, they realized that Orobshi was wearing clothes and on further visits, they were received with arrows and then with guns. The oldest version of the myth I have read one from 1977 and 9, or between 77 and 79, narrated in a precarious Portuguese, ends as follows. Then the boy had clothes on his arms and legs. Then he left water for the Indians and went back. And his relatives went to dance in the village. Then he had an axe, so he gave it to his relatives who were already in the bush. Then he went back to his maloka, and he goes back to dance with his relatives. He already had, has a, a hat and shoes. Then he, becomes, he comes back. His relatives gives him an arrow. Then his relative has a rifle. Then it's over. He stays civilized, and the Indians in their maloka. Francisco presents a version of the myth in chapter one in a night and named origin and the division of the subgroups. It's very similar to the ones I've summarized, except that it does not mention the origin of the whites. 
It ends when Orupshi comes back home, bringing the water. However, in the introduction, he presents a different version. And now I, I will quote uh, the entire version. The division of the Wari, um, of the Wari subgroups happened because an individual, of an individual called Orupshi, who became a white man and was expelled from his group for having se sexual relations with his wife, the, the wife of his older brother. The elders of the Oruwaram people, the subgroup uh, of Francisco, tell that at, uh, that at one time they all lived in one village, but this child called Orupshi was born. According to the elders, he cried a lot when his mother went to do her household, household chores. His busy mother asked her daughter-in-law, the, the wife of Orupshi's older brother, to hold him so that he would stop crying. However, from one moment to the next, he grew big and had sex with his elder brother's wife on the manual plantation. Then one day on this plantation, there was a parrot and this parrot told Orupshi's mother that he was having sex with his sister-in-law. Desperate, the mother told Orupshi's brother about what had happened and the latter indignantly expelled Orupshi from the village and burned all his materials. Orupshi went to live on the large river alone, taking all the village's water with him. The people suffered, but Orupshi parents uh, had water because they put it in the wood wooden hollow. After a while, his older brother decided to go after Orupshi so that he could bring the water to the village. After a long time, Orupshi returned to his parents' village and with him came the rain and everyone was happy with the water. Orupchi said he wanted to go back to the large river and invited all his family members to come with him. And they all went, his parents, Orupchi's wife, and his older brother. The myth ends by saying that each subgroup went to a specific geographic territory, the ones they were inhabiting at the occasion of the contact with the whites, and that further on they met for festival. The beginning makes an unexpected association. The division of the Wadi into subgroups was a consequence of the origin of the whites, an association absent from any other version I've heard or read. Instead of appearing as the outcome of a continuous transformation from king to foreigners, so the members of the other subgroups, and then into enemies, the whites are already there before the subgroups exist. However, the mention of the white is brief and enmity is not explored. So let me try some, some comparisons. So the parallels between the great flood or na 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 and Orupshi are clear and probably that was the reason they were chosen by Francisco as the only two myths to be explored in his thesis, although he's, he, he, he reproduces some other at the end of the thesis, but he just analyzes those two myths. As a being who controls water, Oropishi is associated with a simulacrum of the maternal grandmother, the spirit of the rain. Considering the versions where Orupshi calls a storm before taking the water, both characters provoke heavy rains, although with diametrically opposed consequences, inundation and drought. Bearing in mind the ultimate meaning of a river drying, drying up, we can note that the actions of Orupshi and the old woman produce the same outcome, a merging of land and water, in both cases causing people to die or suffer. In the great flood, the river invades the village, 
making the earth disappear. In Moropshi, the village effectively invades the river, causing the water to vanish. Those are both myths which reflect upon the dangers of mixture, the erasing of differences, and work through the reestablishment of the proper order of things. Examining further Francisco's own versions, we realize that both aim at answering the teacher's questions about origins. However, they keep as a main theme the restoration of differences from a unitary world of sameness. In the flood myth, they were, in Francisco's version, they were all one people restricted to a cave until difference is restored by the intermarriage with other people and group dispersal. In Moropshi, his version begins with the installation of the difference between the Wari and the Whites and goes back to Unicity, saying that the Urowaram all lived in one single village. Difference and plurality are reinstalled when the groups disperse and become the different subgroups. There is also surprising stability of the final episode of the flood myth, when the parents stuck in the rocks or cave curse their offspring, saying that they will not grow anymore and stay like their children, which is apparently another way to express the dangers of the erasure of differences, here taking as that between children and adults or parents. If we identify what disappears and what is added, we can clearly see the main historical changes that happened in those 40 years from the Wadi on one point of view. First, enmity with the whites, which changes from war to moral issues in Francisco's version, no longer makes sense as the whites became either siblings in church and or special political allies uh, as the teachers whom he's writing to, to uh, in his thesis. More than that, it no longer makes sense to stress the rivalry between the subgroups, making them the source of future enemies, as in the versions from the 80s and 90s, as the rituals, the proper and domesticated occasions for these have now disappeared. Mentions of human-animal object transformation, like those from people to water, uh, who were in the water to, a, to water animals, that appear in all my versions from the 80s and 90s, do not make sense when they have adopted the biblical genesis where forms became fixed by God. Parallel transformations occur through the suppression of the mention to the spirit quality of the old woman who brought the rain who becomes just a grandmother, although in one of his versions, he says she was not a real person. Christian moral issues come to the fore. Instead of, of living by himself, Orupshi left because he was, he was enraged. Um, Orupshi, in his version, is expelled by his desperate mother, who, along with everybody else, condemned not the brother for destroying the baby's things, as in earlier versions, but the act of extramarital sex following the missionary's teachings. As I have already commented, schooling brought questions about origins, a respect for nature, the population's problems of nutrition, survival, and autonomy. The difference between the white and the whites is totally internalized to that between the subgroups, which replicates the emphasis the white give today on the difference between their language, the language that are, in fact, uh, slightly different dialects between the subgroups. So now, nowadays, each subgroup adopted in their written products notation signs that reflect and maximize speech differences making their language seem completely different when we read them. They also emphasize difference between their customs and practices between the subgroups 
talking about themselves as if they were different ethnic groups. It looks as if the original difference between the subgroups, which in the past were mainly enacted through rituals, and further on erase it with the regrouping of the survivors from the massacres and epidemics in the government posts just after contact, that difference came back exacerbated as the locus of social difference per se. So to conclude, a few words. As we have seen, the version examined here Uh, reflect upon the dangers of mixture, such as that between land and water, and work on the reestablishment of the proper order of the world. However, when previous differences are reinstalled, like the initial uh, one between land and water, others begin to appear as in a cascade effect, mirroring the fractal scale of differentiations shown by Levi Strauss in his analysis of myth related to the region of the whites in his story of links. Differentiation, the author concludes, Levi Strauss, is what keeps Amazonian conceptual words in motion. Sameness and identity mean the paralyzing of the whole cosmological system. Francisco's versions, like the earlier ones, show the same alternation between sameness and difference. But like the pieces used by Lévi-Strauss Bricolaire, the materials with which he works have changed. They take into consideration Christianity moral issues and the school's scientific concerns with the origin of populations, their distribution and means of survival the concept of nature, the need to preserve it, and many other issues. As shown by Peter Gao, the diachronic analysis of specific myths can reveal the nature of the historical changes while at the same time making the world seem unchanged. As stated by Francisco Oroguera, what he wrote in his thesis is what the ancestors keep saying since the beginning, although, as we have seen, those sayings had to be adapted to a very different cultural environment, the one where they live today. And this is for Peter. Could we come back to his picture, to his photo? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Aparecida, and thanks for giving a, a talk that was so much a feeling the, the spirit of Pete and the, the themes that he explored in his work. So I'll now ask uh, Paolo Fortis to come up and, and give some comments and a, and a response. So over to you, Paolo. You want the lights on, Paolo? I would like to have the picture. Yeah. The lights? The lights? It's, I'm fine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's fine. Yeah. Well, thank you, Patrick, and thank you, Christos, for this invitation, and thank you, Parasida, for such a such an interesting uh, uh, and beautiful paper. Um, so I'm, I'm a former student of Pete. I did my PhD in here, uh, started in 2005. Uh, lots of time has passed, and so um, I'm, I'm here sort of uh, responding to Aparecida's paper, but also thinking uh, through Peter's work and, and, and picking up some aspects that I, that I um, noticed there and, and doing my best there, I suppose, hopefully. So Louis Strauss uh, posed the question about whether a myth can die. As a parasite has just showed to us, they don't. They transform responding to historical circumstances. And in some cases, they even become historical narratives. A parasite is in dialogue with Pete's work on the historical transformation of Piero or Yine myths. An important work, as she has rightly noted, 
has advanced our understanding of indigenous Amazonians' historical agency. Pete was interested in history and in ethnography, and the thrust of his work was really to bring one to bear with the other, and in doing so, he inflected uh, with new dynamism the resources study of Amerindian mythology. He was also concerned with the capacity of myths to transform, even beyond the collective lifespan of, the, of, of the myth tellers, or those who tell specific myths. In brief, what happens when myths survive, but the people who tell them die? Are there traces of a myth among other people's myths? So the kind of questions that, myth, that Pete was also asking. In his later work, he was engaging with what Lévi-Strauss called ensemble, large-scale and complex social units that defy geographic and perhaps even empirical analysis. Social units that we cannot identify by the names of individual peoples like Kine, Kashinawa, Kanamari, etc., etc. I think he was grappling with the tensions between social transformations and the biographical lifespan of stories and of people. In his later work, he raised such questions as what can a myth tell us about the history of a people that is no more? What happens to such larger entity when a gap appears in its mythology and social world? When some versions of the myth and some groups of people disappear? So myths are alive, uh, Pitt told us throughout his work, as they are told and heard in specific circumstances. They are historical objects insofar as they change according to the social circumstances in which they are told and they make history insofar as they obliterate it. So Parasita's work in this respect shows us how the worry have been the subjects of their own history while at the same time being the objects of white people's brutality. Their myths tell a history that outsiders could easily mistake for an eternal return to the self-same, a story of origin a negation of history rather than its obliteration. Two very different things, I think. So whereas in fact myths contain historical transformation, albeit in a, dis in a disguised way. So myth can be said to be objects that contain time and even generate it. In the act of telling a myth, the teller and the hearer access a dimension of time that is both remote and present. The remote dimension is perhaps what Levi-Strauss referred to when he, when, when he was saying that myths obliterate time by means of a constant adjustment to historical circumstances. They render temporal what is actually spatial. Perhaps this is what the Wari mean when they project the differences between the subgroups in time. When they create an origin story, for their internal differences, but at the same time, creating an origin story for white people. So, well, the present dimension of the act of telling a myth and hearing a myth, present dimension of time accessed through the act of telling and hearing a myth has got to do with the context and the relations within which the telling of a myth occurs. So what I want to note here, uh, somehow reading between the lines in what I think is a subtle but important methodological point that runs through a Parasides presentation in dialogue with a similar theme running through uh, Pete's work. So it is about the relations that occur around the telling of a myth. In the first chapter of An Amazonian Myth and Its History, Pete tells us of the circumstances in which Artemio Fazabi told him the myth of the man who was tired of living. This was after the conversation about the moon and what was it like that the Americans found when they went up there. Myths are told to specific people in specific circumstances. So this is what, that is what makes them alive. And I think that really kind of jumps up from out of Peter, Peter's work and of your work on Warimit. 
They both obliterate historical time and create biographical time by means of crafting specific relations. In that, they are like material artifacts that I work with, you know, which attended to and contemplated by people provide a means to navigate biographical relations. As and Susan Kushler and I have argued through um, establishing a dialogue between Amerindian and, Mel and Melanesian ethnographies of the image. Artemio entrusted Pete with one of his ancient people's stories. He responded to Pete's keen curiosity about the experience of taking ayahuasca and to the previous conversation about whether the moon was a planet and not a man with no home wandering in the sky. Pete heard the story and spent a long time thinking about it, so much so that he wrote an entire book based on the insight that that story and the context of its telling afforded. But I also think that there was another aspect that Pete noticed. The fact that a myth told to a non-indigenous person, in this case, a Scottish ethnographer, has a particular agency. It establishes a particular kind of relation. I'd say almost one of mutuality. As he claims in Carolina's story, one of his latest article, it's actually been published by the Revista de Antropologia posthumously. And I quote from Pete, myths are primarily intergenerational social transactions. The social transaction does not take the form of pedagogy, but rather the active construction of the myth teller as a grandparent and the reciprocal active construction of the myth hearer as a grandchild. Myths are primarily phenomena of kinship." End quote. So Aparecida has just shown us that myths are living objects too. They respond to historical circumstances and to new relations like the one between Francisco and his teacher, by transforming. In a dialogue with Pete's work, she shows that the aliveness of myths lies in the relational context in which they are told. They are relational objects that defy time in their content by being in it and creating it through the context of their telling. The context of their telling history is absorbed and then over time erased. It is the work of the anthropologist to go back to that context, to search for its meaningfulness, as Pete has shown us throughout his work. And this is not a trivial task, as we are often part of that context and often assume that we know the reasons why we are told particular myths or particular stories. In most cases, we don't, and it takes a long time and dedication to work that out. And working it out cannot be done without acknowledging some sort of experiencing, which I think can only occur through a relation of mutuality. Pete describes this in his first chapter of an Amazonian myth, where he talks about his dialogue with Artemio. Aparecida also describes this in her last book, Paleto and I, where she tells the story of a decades long relation with our deceased worry adopted father. As Vine Deloria Jr. says in God is Red, and I quote, it was not what people believed to be true that was important, but what they experienced as true. Hence, revelation was seen as a continuous process of adjustment to the natural surrounding and not as a specific message that was valid for all times and places." End quote. So doesn't this capture the circumstantiality of myth-telling? Doesn't it capture the profound relationality, relationality of the act of telling a myth to somebody? To somebody, not anybody. And by the same token, capturing the sense of truth that such relational act generates. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paolo. Um, I'd ask uh, Aparecida maybe to come back up here, if that's okay. Um, and I'll go to the room for questions. 
and hopefully have time to take some online. I do have another mic here, so let's hope people online can hear it okay. Um, I'm sure you'll let us know if you can, or tell us to speak more quietly, more loudly. Um, does anyone have any any questions? Otherwise, I can use the chair's prerogative and ask one myself. But we have slightly less time than our usual seminar slot um, because we have a, a discussion at various speeches. But... Online yeah, okay, I can, maybe I can come up to you, Bridget, and read that, just so we can keep this picture up. Parisia, can you, uh, first very uh, simple question, can you tell us a little bit about this photograph here, because I'm very glad that you, you brought it, um, because I was actually trying to hunt it down uh, from Carlos Fausto, who I saw had, had maybe featured it, or had a copy of it, but I never managed to get hold of it, so it's great that you brought it here today. Mm. And to show where is it where, where, where's pete so this is a photo taken in 1997 in otavalo ecuador uh to a trip we were in a kind of americanist meeting and then peter traveled with carlos faustin uh to to otavalo and this is taken there as far as i i know i remember yeah but it's uh kindly uh, sent to me by Carlos Fausto to be presented here. Thank you. Okay, I'll go to a question online from Tiago Sa, uh, who asks, I wonder if the first change is linguistically marked by some sort of epistemic marker. Also, has the Wari language those kind of morphemes? More what? Morphemes. More? More morphemes. More themes. Oh my God. Uh, um, well, in fact, there is a change in language because the myth uh, was written by Francisco in Portuguese. So uh, I cannot uh, say about this uh, this change within what language uh, between the versions I've been I've been quoting here because the versions from 1977. Uh, 79, where I read them in Portuguese. They were in Portuguese. They were collected, meaning they were narrated in Portuguese. My versions were in Wari, so in Wari language, so they were all in Wari language. And then from the version, the two versions that Francisco uh, quoted in his thesis, one is from 2015, from a school book, so it was already in Portuguese. And the other one was written by himself in Portuguese, so I cannot uh, answer. Um, and another question from online from Bruna Franchetto. Indigenous activists and academics in Brazil vehemently reject the use of the term myth and propose and use the term history or histories, as in this is our history. Uh, what can you comment about this? Uh, what I, I can say is that he uses myth in his thesis, and that's why I'm, I keep the myth, okay? Mateus, is it Mateus? No, Richard. Hi, um, thank you very much. I wondered if I could just invite you to say a little bit more about the impact of schooling here, which, which, which you touched upon. I was really struck by one of the ethnographic details, which was the introduction of clock, clock time um, within the myth, and I suppose that general move towards more abstract context independent modes of knowledge um, and how that sort of chimes with observations in developmental psychology um, I'm thinking of alexander luria and work like that which thinks about the resistance prior to those forms of schooling of generating those kind of abstract forms of knowledge and i was interested to see that kind of abstraction being introduced into the myth here in contrast to what was then discussed about this absolute relationality um, of, of, of myth. Is the myth becoming less relational as, as the schooling um, was introduced? Mm. Thank you, that's, that's very interesting. Um, okay, so I, I don't know if I can say that the schooling brought everything because in fact, uh, missionization, the missionaries, they were there before. So they were the ones who introduced the schooling. So at least among the Wari, and I'm sure among several other indigenous peoples in Brazil, uh, it's very difficult to disentangle uh, the uh, Christianity and missionization and conversion. 
from teachings, from schooling. So several concepts were already there in the Bible. So as we, we know, but the Bible has many numbers and um, after 200 years or after, uh, so there are concepts of time already there. And the Wari, they, 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 they learn to, to read, mainly to read the Bible. And, and nowadays, except for school uh, works, they just read the Bible. They are not very interested, still not very interested in, in, in literature, in reading. Um, so those concepts, I think that the Wari, they, they use them very, very much when they are, of course, only when they're speaking Portuguese because they do not translate. And, and the Wari, they mainly speak among themselves in their, 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 their indigenous language. So those concepts are not part of their daily lives when they're speaking with each other. But when they want to precise something like, uh, so the elders, of course, they will say, when the sun is here, I'll meet you. But of course, the young people who have uh, clocks, they will say, oh, watches, they will say, oh, at two, we'll meet at two. So this is something that is part of their lives. And they, they translate, for example, the sun being here by two o'clock or, or something like that. So they, they try to make some translations. But they try, they, they usually, at, at least at the last moment, the, the latest moment where I've been with them in 2019, uh, before the pandemic, they were still uh, uh, just restricted to Portuguese when using those concepts. And of course, when the myth is narrated in Wari language, there, there, there are no concepts. So the language keeps the, the absence of those uh, measurements and numbers, etc. But when they, they write them in Portuguese, of course, they use it. So it's mixed because I think that uh, while they are, uh, until they do not, uh, you know, they keep the language, while they keep the language, they, they can inhabit those two words. In, in different, you know, at the same time or different contexts. So they have two different relational words. Uh, the words where they, they interact with the non indigenous, where they use Portuguese and measurements and concepts and abstract concepts, and the, wor the word where they inhabit with their, their, their um, neighbors, etc. But I, I, I will take the opportunity to say that the, the, the path I, take, I took. To here because when I I've been studying schooling for now um, oh god time passes eight years <laughs> and after studying for a decade missionization to conclude that they are really just almost the same thing happening the, the effects I mean the effects and and um, when I, I read Francisco's master thesis. So I've been reading their productions a lot. So doing a lot of work, just reading what they write at, at the university or school context. And I, when I read this myth, my, my first thought was, oh my God, what did he make of the myth? This is something else. So I went to Levi Strauss because I, 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 the first thought that came to me was the myth is that there is no more of this myth. This is totally different. And then I came to the, the article by the Vistros. And then I was invited to give this lecture. And then I, by chance, I had this by the side. And then I went to an Amazonian myth and its history, which is, a, you know, one of, for me, one of the best books ever, ever, not just for Americanists, but the best book ever. And then I was reading, just rereading the book, of course. And when I reread the, I re the book, I said, oh, no, that's the same myth. Of course, the answer is here. So what I wrote is a kind of tribute to Pete, saying that Pete opened my eyes to see what I, I, I was taking as, you know, a death of a myth. Because then I, it took me, you know, a lot of time taking all the versions that I had and past versions and everything to analyze the myth and to understand that he, that he chose two specific myths, not others that were intrinsically related and that were myths that talked about mixture and, and then the distribution and then multiplicity, that this kind of uh, alternation between um, being the same and being a lot, uh, a multiple. So 
the solution to my conundrum was in Pete's book. So that's why I decided, I said, so I, sh I have to tell this to Pete. So I'm telling him, Pete, you have you helped me to, to, to understand that what is happening in school has a lot of, of uh, continuities, if well examined, with past uh, um, versions of past things. So that's the work I've been doing, in fact, for a long time, trying to see how uh, missionization and Christianity, uh, what is left, meaning which are the continuities between what I've, I've learned from the Wadi in the 80s when they were not converted and, and nowadays. So now I, I just found the same thing. It's the same thing, just in myth. And that's because of Peter. Thanks very much for a, a beautiful talk. And uh, as uh, uh, comment, Paolo, Paolo is coming to me, I, I was just thinking about the question that was asked earlier. And, and of course, Levi Strauss says that history is myth told on the time axis, doesn't he? Uh, so, uh, so in a sense, there is this ambiguity always in Levi Strauss about what is myth and what is not myth. Uh, it made me think of Pete's uh, essay he wrote on Ossian. In a, I think it's in the volume on beauty that Stephanie Bunn uh, produced, where he talks about a person who wrote, who presents himself as writing down Ossian's, transliterating Ossian stories, uh, got himself into trouble because eventually people discovered that he's, he, he had not, he just wasn't, there was no historical person called Ossian. And, and Peter points out in the essay, well, Actually, if you treated this as a myth, it wouldn't be a problem. This problem would occur in the first place because it's only because of our idea of the author that uh, the author of the story that's causing us a problem with this with this recounting of the of the, the myths of Ossian, if you like. Uh, so I suppose I suppose the, the long short sort of it was Paolo made me realise that Pete had imported a sort of existential biographical theme, which I'd never really realized, I'd never quite realized that um, uh, he, he's, what he's done is important a kind of existential biographical dimension to thinking about myth, uh, which it seems very important. I wonder whether you could comment on those. He kind of goes back, he keeps going back to Levi Strauss, but then he, he, he returns to the theme of the moment when the myth is told by a specific person, mm -hmm. and, and, and that seems to be the, the kind of key in a way. Thank you. I think this is one of the most important contributions of Pete, that to incarnate myth and to, to make it uh, the, the myth telling a moment that is important per se. So I think this is uh, one of the most important contributions. And in the beginning of the uh, Amazonian myth and its history, there is a whole personal history there of Pete telling about his origins in Scotland and about be being alone there and how it was people were surprised by his loneliness, where are his parents and his relatives. So it's very autobiographical in a, in a sense that he's there in, in the context. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to develop those those uh, settings, the the, you know, the 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 context here in this talk because of the time. But I I, I understand that you know the, the, the moment because the first uh, myth from the the first versions from 70, 70, uh, 77, 79 were were narrated to uh, in Portuguese in a bad Portuguese because in the Portuguese version is full of uh, grammatical problems, if you can say so. And then um, with some different words, and so you, you see that the person was trying to explain something to the government agent. And my, my versions were um, several, and they were told, told me, they, were, they, they, they told me in different occasions for different reasons. Sometimes I was just there asking them to please tell me this story and please tell me this other story. Or sometimes uh, they just came in and, and told the story. And sometimes that was because something was happening in the moment. And, and sometimes it was just because I was uh, asking them. So 
but I think that the important um, contextualization here is because it's of Francisco telling the myth to not telling, writing the myth to his teachers. That's what he was doing. And examining, uh, being in the classroom with them for months and, and, and then examining the school books, I understood what he was telling to, what, what he was aiming at. He was aiming at uh, 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 comply to, uh, to, to adequate what he taught to what he was learning, to what is expected from him, from his teachers, like respect for nature and etc., and, and knowledge of time and etc. But at the same time, what I, I've noticed is that as if the myth was a kind of black hole that just took the things inside itself and, and it has a kind of force of its own, just again, because it's as if, although he wanted to talk about the cave, Plato cave maybe, because I examined, there is a, a philosophy book about, they, they, they were taught about the cave. And although he's trying to, 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 to tell the teachers that the Wadi knew, or the Wadi have an origin, and that is um, that coincides with what what uh, the non indigenous think about origins. Wait, the uh, the myth just can't resist that change in a way. The myth just forces itself to to get into the story. That's why I I, I, I understand there is an unconscious aspect of the myth. So it's not just conscious transformation from my point of view as it seems to be like at six o'clock they were leaving the cave to look for food etc but there is something unconscious that is underneath and he doesn't talk about it because of course it's not conscious so it's about you know this alternation between sameness and difference sameness and difference and i think this surprised me in a way that it's very hard I've been, I've been among the Wadi for, for decades, and when I arrived there, they were the way anthropologists like. They were doing rituals and dancing. And then I arrived there in the, in the beginning of the 2000s, and they were going to church and were not doing rituals anymore. So I was so frustrated, uh, you know, uh, prejudice, etc., etc. So I was very frustrated. And then they became very interested in schooling. I was again just kind of where are the rituals and everything. But then what I understand working is that if I I just dive inside the things, I can I can find out. I can find out what I knew, what what was there. So it's in a modified way, but it's still there. It is still there. So I can recognize the wadi. Uh, I can still recognize. It's not the answer exactly the answer to your question, but I, I just took the opportunity to go a bit into what I would like to 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 say if I had time. Great, uh, Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned that again and again this tension between sameness and difference. And if I, I, I pretended that I didn't hear your talk today, if I pretended that we were not talking about Levi Strauss or P, I would feel that I am in a European context and I'm listening. I am sorry, I didn't. I am in a European context and I'm listening about nationalism. Because it is exactly the same story, it is exactly the same myth, it is exactly the same tension between how we are same at the same time, how we're different, mm -hmm. and how there's always this tension to be same, but different at the same time. So I would like to ask you, do you see a parallel reading between your work and someone of us working in Europe, for example, mm -hmm. thinking along the lines of how identity is played out within this tension? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is very interesting because when we make comparisons, we, we we make some caricatural uh, examples. So we have to make oppositions to make things clear. But of course, the things are very complex. What I think is that 
although it, it does not work like that in real life, we, like Europeans, Cuban, etc., etc., uh, we aim in a way uh, at identity, in a way that um, not, you know, of course, different peoples, they, they have their own identity, but this process of, of constant differentiation, which is different from uh, oppositions between identity and, 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 and difference, like uh, stable oppositions, if I, I understand. So we are, we are the same, but we are different, uh, etc. But what I think that the Amazonian indigenous people are doing is that they are trying always to make, to differentiate from themselves all the time. So they are trying to make things different, different and different and different. There is a constant process of making difference. So there is no uh, stability. But they are they are always kind of inventing or creating something new to to become different and again different and again different. So you see this um, uh, uh, um, Levistro's study of of Amerindian mythology, although you you said that we we are not speaking now of Levistro's, but uh, he says that in Amazonian mythology, what you see is that any time you get to sameness, even when you get to the the twins in the myth, when the twins appear, what Levisro says that in the Greek, um, Roman Greek mythology, when you have twins, they look, they are the same. So that's identity, which is uh, emphasized. But when you get Amazonian myth, when you have twins, they are never from, from the same father, or if they are the same father, they differentiate, they are, they, they, they are different uh, between, uh, either before being born or after being born. So there is a kind of allergy to sameness. I mean, a kind of existential allergy to sameness. So there must be difference all the time. And I think it's a bit different from what you, you've been um, uh, thinking about. I don't know what you expose it to me. So that's my thought. Okay. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I can try. <laughs> okay, can I get here? Are you going to put the image now? So, uh, is it Carlos is online if you want to unmute yourself? Who's Carlos? Hello, it's me. Okay. Oh, Carlos. Hello, Carlos. Oh, I know him. <laughs> uh, good evening. Uh, no, no, I cannot hear you. I can turn up though, here. Hello, hello. Wait, 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 wait. Can you try now, Carlos? Can you hear me? Oh yeah, yeah, we can. I can hear. Not so loud. But... Uh, hello, everybody. Hello, Parisida. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, your lecture is most interesting, and it puts us in the, the same way as Peter Gao did, uh, reevaluating the problem of me meet uh, Levistros and meet in depth, in profundity, in its out scope. I mean that uh, uh, Paul Ricoeur's criticism, and also Derrida, and also the, the performative turn, should be reevaluated when we look at the, the problem you brought us, because it belongs to the problem, the, the ancient, uh, debate on discrete and continuity, or mm -hmm. to put it some other way, history and writing and, and written stuff, oral versus uh, written stuff. And uh, I mean, when Levistro said to, to Riquet, well, Semitic and Mesopotamian tradition that you are examining in, in Wari's landscape, 
they they belong to the triumph of the, the this creed. Uh, they belong to arithmetics and geometry, as Greek was promoted. And I do think that Mies, as, as he argues to discussing with Hikea, Mies has a, a much larger scope, and you have just proved it. And Go did it before. Uh, wonderful. Uh, I don't know if you want to reply. Thank you very much. Um, Carlos, I, I think I've lost half of what you said because the sound here is not very good. But I understood that you, you were just, uh, you want to think about the discrete and the continuous uh, as a, a difference between uh, the oral and the written, according to Ricoeur or, or something like that. But, Yes, I, I praise your your presentation because it puts the, the the finger sharply into this problem. It's time to to retake to reevaluate this problem, not to bury it in the Hitler yeah. Levi Strauss debate of sixty three, nineteen sixty three. Okay, thank you. So it's not a question; it's a comment. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Carlos. Thank you for watching us. <laughs> Uh, Christoph. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samarisida, for this great talk. It, uh, this whole uh, question of uh, or critique of origins and, and death, beginnings and end in thinking about myth uh, made me remember that chapter. You may remember the, the title of it. I don't. Uh, it's in the State and Shamanism volume. Uh, it's on the river... Oh, River Shaman, yes, yes, yes. An yes. amazing article where he is uh, stressing the importance of the middle point or the in-between, which rhymes so well with uh, Le Levi Strauss's uh, table manners, the, you know, the middle man in the canoe. Mm -hmm. right? So I was wondering if you want to talk a little bit more about this in-between and the work of the in-between in, in myth-making. Wow. This is a wonderful um, thought, but I, I have to think about it to, to, to say something about it now. So, uh, yeah, what he says is that uh, the, the table manners it is very important. So if you exaggerate, if you just have this or this, there's something bad that happens and you have to find the middle way to do things. I don't know if I can say something uh, around this on those myths. I I might, but I have to think about. But it's a very good thought, so I'll, I'll just make some thinking. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, I just cannot make it now. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Chris. Tony. Thank you. Thank you, Parasita and the organizers of the memorial lecture. Um, Thank you for bringing Pete back to us. Um, this isn't so much a, um, a question, but perhaps in the spirit of the occasion, you'll take it as a, a comment and a compliment if I respond with a myth. Um, Pete wasn't only an Amazonianist. Um, he was a Melanesianist too. And I suspect and would like to speculate that the origin of Christos's story is from a Slavic anthropologist called Yadron Mimika, um. who has a very forthright way of telling stories in the way that we remember Pete telling stories. Um, I met Pete for the first time in 1992 in Manchester when he was a temporary teaching fellow. And um, Yadron visited one day, and at the end of a very animated conversation about Christianity, he stood up stamped and said, there is no burning bush. And that was all that could be said. <laughs> what, what did it mean? But everyone took a meaning from it. <laughs> um, Pete taught this fantastic course on Melanesia. Beautiful, insightful, um, very influential on me. Um, we were also flatmates, housemates, and I'll pass over the experience of sharing a house with um, Pete. Um, <laughs> But he had this baggy um, denim jacket and it wore out and he threw it away and I fished it out of the dustbin when Pete had moved to the LSE and I wore it and I learned to, you know, be Pete when I read and thought about anthropology. 
And of course, then I took it with me to Papua New Guinea. And of course, then someone said, hey, I like that jacket. And so Pete's jacket is in Papua New Guinea, floating oh. around, having a, a second life. Yeah. <laughs> um, so also at Manchester at the time was Jimmy Wiener. Um, and there was a dialogue um, between um, Jimmy and, and Pete and Yadro um, about the interpretation of myth and, uh, and sociality, and very vociferous, very forceful, very insightful, dazzling, very instructive. Hits your skin and kind of takes decades to seep in. Um, Jimmy Wiener was writing a book called The Heart of the Pearl Shell about his fieldwork in Papua New Guinea, where he had ignored the things that anthropologists usually do, of doing spade work of genealogy and kinship and all that nonsense, and went straight for the myths, analyzed them with a version of Str Levi-Straussian um, structuralism through Roy Wagner, symbolic obviation, figured out the myths, and then went to prove the myths by doing what we would recognize as ethnography and found social forms. Um, and so Pete was in on this conversation. Pete had just uh, written um, of mixed blood. And um, I suppose what I wanted to, to um, speak up for um, is, is, is Pete here and Pete's radicalness. Because I think one of the things that Pete was aware of is the need in anthropology and in humanity to learn how to make myths die. We're still living with the legacy of a kind of Christian division of the world and its consequences. And this decolonization project in our discipline and in our institutions um, has to learn how to revise and undo and transform those kinds of myths. And Pete had seen through the discipline, had seen through the difficulties and the limitations of going off to capture um, social forms or society, rather than understanding that the myth is the organization. The myth is the dynamics. There's nothing that stands still. There's nothing that's being governed. There are no rules. There are no structures. And everything is being made up on multiple versions all of the time. Every time people spoke and engaged and learned and interacted with the world. So I think I think I remember Pete as a radical, a radical in anthropology, a radical in the, uh, the anthropology of Amazonia, but the ra a radical in the anthropology of um, Melanesia too. And I just wanted to close with a memory that the last time I was with my friend Paolo here and with Pete's friends, we were at the confluence of two rivers in Blur Assel on a fine sunny day and we each held some earth and we passed it down to Pete, underground, in the rocks, in his cave. We listened to Scottish music. We remembered our friend. And on a still day that was blue sky and clouds gently passing, suddenly at that moment, there was this wonderful breeze that came down the valley, whistled through the trees and made them sing. And the breeze headed off in the direction of Amazon. Whoa. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So I feel like that's probably uh, quite an apt moment to, to end the, the, the seminar and the, the lecture. Um, unless a parasita wants to say any final words in, in response to that. I, I do. Yeah. Okay. So it's also a personal story with, with Pete that involves the author we are both devoted to, Levi Strauss. So we met Levi Strauss personally uh, for the first time together, the two of us. And we are both so nervous. We were in Paris. And we, we really kind of love Levi Strauss and his work. He's kind of our favorite author. And it was such an honor to have a space, you know, moment to talk with him. So we went together and we were, before going to, to his office, we were sitting there on a bench on the street in Paris, deciding, just talking about what is going to come, which language shall we speak? 
and shall we speak French or, or English or, or Portuguese, even Portuguese, because Levisius could speak Portuguese. And then we were there very nervous. And then we went and we sit down and Levisius was there and talked with Levisius and we were really nervous and we talked in English. And after, I don't know, 10 minutes, which was the maximum that Levisius uh, uh, stayed with people usually. The, the secretary had, uh, uh, you know, uh, told us before, just after 10 minutes, just try to go out. And then we were there, and of course he was really kind, and, and he, he knew our work because he read everything from, you know, from Brazil in Portuguese, English, or whatever. He knew everything, the literature at the time, everything. And then afterwards, I and Peter, still, you know, nervous, we went to a, to a cafe to try to remember. We said, let's talk to each other each sentence he said. First, never forget, never forget. We, we did. And, and we were there. Did he say that? Yes, he said this. And he said this. And he said, yes, I remember. So we had, so part of the memory is not here now. But, and then we decided to, to go to a fancy restaurant to celebrate this moment. <laughs> so it was, a, a, you know, in the evening. So it was a very special moment for the two of us. And I was so happy that Pete was with me and we met our idol together. <laughs> That's one personal memory. So I miss him deeply, really miss him. Okay, thank you.